Goss is teaching. Right. Good. So I guess I'll, I'll start now. So I already put the links to the link to the slides in the chat. Uh, what are you What are you using now for your chat your charts? I forgot. Sorry. Are you using Corto still? Yeah, Corto. Okay. Yeah, Corto and Julia call still. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, so I'll be talking about chapter five. I'm not sure how far I could go, but uh, it's particularly dense as well. Um, so in chapter five, the the key thing to know is everything about inter polynomial interpolation, and yeah. um. And how this polynomial interpolation is related to numerical differentiation and numerical integration, uh, and then derive some of those properties. More or less, it's something like that, uh, and evaluate their accuracy. Oops. And uh, there's a couple of things that are, I think, a bit new in terms of Julia. I just put some of them here. Uh, I'm not sure if this is exhaustive, but uh, with respect to the chapter, chapter five and what I've seen before, it feels like these are the new ones. Uh, it seems that you could do some shorthand, uh, leg for legend. I don't know how how far of a shorthand you could go, like LE or L, I don't know, but uh, I, I saw leg. The other thing is that uh, there are some linear algebra operations like the tuple. Uh, instead of the square bracket, you have this, um, uh, the usual parentheses and the dot product of two vectors. There's also a layout uh, where you could, so this is similar to something like MF row in R, uh, where you have the first number here is like the number of rows. So you'll have two plots uh, on top of each other, two, one, something like that. Okay, so two rows and then one column. And then you also have subplots uh, where it, you could direct some of the plotting to certain subplots when you have these kinds of layouts. Okay. Uh, another thing from the graphic side is that you would see an option called M equals colon O, which creates sort of like a graph, a graphing paper kind of feel to the to the figure. It's it may not be very obvious, but there is sort of like outline an out an outline of a graphing paper superimposed on the usual plot uh, and then you also have uh, an option to remove the ticks from the y-axis I think there should be an x tick as well um, and then there's you have this x flip equals true where you could sort of like uh, flip the x-axis so instead of going from uh, one from zero to something large, you could flip the, you could do it in descending order. Okay. Uh, particularly useful when you do sort of like log plots, I think. And then you have this annotate where you could, uh, again, put annotations to the curves that you plot uh, on your graph. And then this fill equals zero is sort of like something like shading underneath the curve for integration. Uh, you will also, I'm not sure if conditional statements actually show up before, but here it was particularly, you, you see it more often. Uh, you could do, you, you have sort of like the pattern for conditional statements and you could also uh, return functions. Okay. You could also return functions here. And then with respect to the sort of like the subject matter, Julia related commands for the subject matter, you have uh, a couple of uh, interpolation methods, polynomials.fit, which I think does van der Mond kind of stuff from before. And then you have piecewise linear interpolation. So PL, piecewise linear, and then interpolation. Uh, and then spline 1D, which is their implement uh, for cubic splines. So for P Plinter, uh, this is from FNC. I, and spline 1D, I think, is not part of FNC, but uh, part of Julia. And then you have uh, the weights, the weights that are needed for numerical dif differentiation 
are can be found or could be obtained from FD weights. Uh, one thing that I want to share is that um, if you look at FD weights in function 5.4.7, which I think is near the end here, let me make this larger. In line 35, you'll see something like W here, which was is never used in the code. So I'm not sure uh, this this could be safely omitted as far as I could as far as I could see. I'm not sure if the built-in FD weights as opposed to the display FD weights are different from each other. So I haven't checked that one. Um, and then there are a couple of numerical integration algorithms. One is sort of like quad GK. Uh, this quad GK is used in the book to, to calculate the, the quote unquote exact uh, value of the integral. Um, and then you have uh, an implementation of the trapezoid rule and an implementation of, of adaptive integration in, in adapt. Okay. I think those are the new things with respect to Julia uh, in this uh, in this chapter. Um, so this time I'll, I'll do it a little bit differently. I'll introduce the key theory for sort of like the interpolation part, then do a bit of the exercises and then move on to the theory for the next a uh, couple of things instead of go going through all the theory at once because here it's a bit more uh, a bit more varied. So uh, so now I'll talk about inter interpolation. The interpolation problem is as described in the slide here. You have a bunch of points n plus one distinct points, and the t sub zeros of the t sub n's are ordered, and these uh, t sub zeros up t sub zero up to t sub n, they are called nodes. Uh, if you put them all together, they're called the node set uh, in the in the textbook. Um, the target is to find an interpolant p of x, a function of x, such that you have this kind of property. Okay, so when you evaluate uh, the polynomial at each of these t sub i's, it gets the corresponding y sub i uh, for that particular t sub i. That's essentially the target. Okay, and you've seen this in terms of uh, the van der Mond, uh kind of stuff from before. Now, uh, the biggest issue in the text in section 5.1, and they have a demonstration of it, is that uh, if you do interpolation, polynomial interpolation at equally spaced nodes, uh, it's actually ill-conditioned as the degree of polynomial grows. So I, I guess this is a counterpart of the overfitting kind of uh, concept you encounter in statistics. Of course, the context is a little bit different, but uh, essentially this is similar to an overfitting kind of situation. Um, that's the main issue. And uh, the solution uh, is actually to not to have high degrees of polynomials, but to keep the degree of polynomial low, low enough, but you have some sort of like flexibility, but you don't want to have too much flexibility. So the idea is to have polynomials of lower degree, okay? And then add some smoothing, uh, add some smoothing to achieve this, if, to, so that this ill conditioning will be minimized. The book doesn't really show that the, that the ill conditionedness is actually lessened. Uh, but uh, it sort of like steers towards that direction or at least motivates it from a piecewise linear interpolation point of view, which is in section 5.2. So, so the, um, the solution here is, achieve, is sort of like achieved because of a couple of nice properties. Uh, when you have piecewise uh, interpolants, they tend to have a nice geometric structure Okay, so there's sort of like a linear, a linearity uh, present uh, when you have these kinds of piecewise uh, interpolants. And then the smoothing, if you want to achieve this kind of smooth, if you want to achieve smoothing, you would have to prevent sharp turns. So if you have um, piecewise linear, 
it's like connecting the dots, right? If you do connecting the dots, there would be sharp turns. So to, uh, to prevent those sharp turns, you have to restrict the values of the derivative. So you need to introduce the, introduce these kinds of uh, restrictions. So the with respect to the first point about the nice geometric structure, uh, they introduce uh, what is called cardinal functions, which uh, are related to basis functions. Um, but the but the discussion is not very uh, not very tight, at least at least for on a first reading. So you have uh, cardinal functions, and these cardinal functions actually are very important in the sense that every interpolant could be written as a linear combination of the cardinal function of cardinal functions okay now um an example of some of these cardinal functions are is this hat function okay is this hat function h sub k it's available in section 5.2 the demo has a has a missing code as well uh they don't have the legend so if you don't want the legend it's legend equals colon none so that you don't have that legend i also use legend equals false false that that works yes. too okay great yeah <laughs> for some reason i just thought uh, maybe none would work ah it works <laughs> so, <laughs> okay well. thanks for that yeah the, now the the problem with this kind of setup is that uh for the piecewise linear interpolant uh it's sort of like uh how should I put it the book provides the cardinal functions what the cardinal functions look like but it's actually difficult to sort of like find close forms for some of these cardinal functions. Uh, and it depends on your perspective. So the idea is that either you provide sort of like your, your basis functions and then fit your polynomial accordingly, or you start with a polynomial and then impose your desired properties on that polynomial and then solve a system of equations that uh, arise from the restrictions that you've imposed on that polynomial. So if you do the first approach, uh, piecewise linear interpolants are very nice in the sense that you already have the basis functions available to you. But for cubic splines, at least from the book, it seems that it's hard to find the closed form for them. So what they do instead is to ditch the cardinal functions. It's still in the background, but aim for something a bit more natural, which is specify the, the function that you want, okay? What, what kind of polynomial you want. So here it's a cubic polynomial and then impose some restrictions on this polynomial so that uh, you will achieve, uh, so that some restrictions will be imposed and you could sort of like control the shape of this uh, polynomial. And it turns out that those restrictions when you Put them all together you're creating a system of equations which will help you determine the unknown coefficients of of the polynomial that you've specified so it doesn't have to be cubic spline it could be quadratic as well it's in fact one of the exercises to do the quadratic version of the of this spline thing um and it turns out for cubic splines you only have to solve a linear linear system okay and it allows you to impose the constraints directly. So if you want a particular level of smoothness, you could put that in, and then it has it it, it implies certain restrictions on your co on, on the coefficients. Okay. So if if you go through section five point three, there's sort of like the the full implementation of these uh, cubic splines, and the the sort of like idea is that you have all of those nodes and all of those nodes between two nodes, you have a sub interval. And in each of these sub intervals, you have a cubic polynomial that you fit inside that particular, in each of those sub intervals. So you have S is the overall interpolant and then S sub K is the cubic in polynomial for each 
uh, subinterval. And if you do a count, and the book does that too, you'll find that there are four n, four times n unknown coefficients. Um, and you need a square system, so you need four n four times n restrictions. Uh, in order to determine those uh, those coefficients, uh, and it turns out that some of those restrictions, most of those restrictions are all of those restrictions are actually linear. Okay, and those restrictions are listed down in the slide as follows. So you have the requirement, for example, this first requirement is that those cubic polynomials, okay, they should pass through these two points, so adjacent nodes. Okay, adjacent nodes in the sense that you have t sub k minus one and t sub k, uh, your cubic spline should pass through those two points. And that already gives you two times n linear constraints. And then you want smoothing, you, you want to have smoothing restrictions. So this part here is sort of like saying that it's about the polynomial in the previous subinterval and the pre and the and the polynomial after that particular subinterval so it's about how the transition from one subinterval to another so in this situation what you want is you don't want to have you want the the derivatives to agree at the point of the transition so so you have t sub k minus 2 t sub k minus 1 and t sub k and when you have the polynomial on the first subinterval, you want it to connect smoothly to the next uh, cubic uh, polynomial in the next subinterval. So that's what this uh, next thing is sort of like doing. And the other, the next one, which is the second derivative, that also uh, imposes additional uh, additional smoothing, so as to prevent those sharp turns and to have sort of like a smooth transition uh, as you move from one subinterval to another. So the the book also has the sort of like the count of all of these things. And it's more instructive to do the exercise in 5.3.1 so that you could actually feel the counts for yourself. And you could see how how it sort of like works instead of the more general setting that they start with. Uh, and then you quickly realize that there are four n minus two linear constraints so far, and you only need two more, two more linear constraints, and then you're done. And those two linear constraints will come from restrictions at the at the boundary. Okay. So either either you get it from the application. Okay. So this is sort of like very reminiscent of like initial value problems in, in ordinary differential equations. You need some way to, to determine an, undeter, uh, an undetermined constant in a solution to a differential equation. You either have it from the problem itself, or you have a couple of alternatives that you see here, which is what is called a natural spline, where the second derivative at the boundary point T sub zero and the boundary point T sub n are both uh, equal to zero, okay? The other one is what is called a not a not spline. And uh, and it's about the, the node that is before the boundary. So you have T sub one and T sub n minus one here. And I think I have a typo here. This should be the third derivative, okay? This should be triple prime. Um yeah. Uh to be honest, I'm I'm not sure about the in interpretation of the of the third derivative in this situation or how to sort of like get a sense of what it would look like visually. Um, but the book sort of like mentions that the polynomials will be identical uh for for certain subintervals. So let me just raise that here. Yeah, so so something like this here. So it, so the values of in the first three derivatives of the cubic polynomials s one and s two they agree at the particular node, okay. And similarly for uh, t sub n minus one, the node t sub n minus one, and you'll have two additional restrictions from from it. 
and then you're you're done you all you effectively have all of the all of the needed restrictions all of the linear restrictions that you need and they're 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 supposed to be independent they're linearly independent of each other okay there so this should be triple prime instead of double prime sorry about that there so so those are sort of like the um, uh types of interpolants that are available and of course this book will have to talk about conditioning and then you also have to talk about uh convergence in the sense of in what sense is this approximate are these approximations doing their job I, I think I'll pause here for a while uh if there are questions now No, I think you're you're on, you're on track on that. I do like the, I do. I'm with you. I'm kind of like my eyes kind of glaze over when he starts going deep. I know it's important, but when he starts going deep into the conditioning and all that stuff, I'm like, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, so I can't make my I can't make a stick in my head for some reason. <laughs> yeah, I, I I I tried to summarize most of it. I uh, hope it reaches, but again, it's uh the the book is uneven in certain places. So yeah. Yeah, that's my feeling. I don't know if you if you feel the same though. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think this is great. Yeah. Okay, so I'll move on to the next one. Okay. So this conditioning stuff. Um. Uh, in the first section, they talk about sort of like the bounds and the condition number. Uh, I'm I'm the proof. I think is okay. I think it's understandable to some extent. But uh, uh, I think I had a couple of difficulty show, or at least it wasn't very obvious to me right away that the um, that an interpolant is a linear operator or so of sorts. It, it it's hard to write down the proof for that myself. So I I think I gave up after a while and then accepted and just accepted it for for the moment. But. Um, the, but the bounds part is relatively relatively easy to to work to work with. Um, so the phi, the phi sub case here are the cardinal functions. So these are functions here, and the this is the the sup norm or the infinity norm. Um, so you have these bounds, and the bounds uh, are about the range of the of the cardinal functions. Okay. And then for piecewise linear interpolation, it turns out that um, for hat functions, uh, the maximum value of their range is one. And when you take the sum over all nodes, over all K of those hat functions, the sum is also equal to one. So that's why this, this left side will be one, this right side will be one, and therefore the condition number will be equal to one. Uh, for piecewise linear interpolation. That's sort of like the argument uh, that they have there. Okay. And then for the cubic spline, they don't talk about conditioning here. So that's, it's kind of a bit of a letdown, but this is, this is, I think it's hard to do the conditioning number for this part is because the perturbation that you want to consider when you do a conditioning, a, con a calculation for the condition number, it actually has a domino effect in the sense that it, doesn't start with basis functions. It starts with what you desire, put the restrictions, and then you have a coefficient that will, a co set of coefficients that you would solve um, as part of a linear system. So when you, when you perturb the data a bit, it affects all of the coefficients at the same time. So that's what uh, makes the calculation a bit more a bit more difficult, I think. So in that sense, there's a domino there's a domino effect. So instead of tracing the perturbations to the cardinal functions uh, for cubic splines, it's much more difficult because the the cardinal functions are not available in closed form. Hmm. I um, don't think I read this section, but from what I know about Gams. Mm. Can't you write down cubic splines as a basic basis functions? Uh, so, so that's that's also the that's also what I was wondering before. I I seem to recall something like that, but I didn't dig into that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 
yeah, <laughs> some homework that, some homework to think about but for for me i have it i don't use it regularly in practice so that's why it's not something that is very natural to me right away well although i've heard of it but the uh but i as you mentioned i i also seem to recall that there's there's sort of like a set of basis functions for cubic splines which would seem strange in this in this situation yeah i vaguely remember that too if that's the case yeah. yeah yeah so i think that would be good homework as well for our next meeting mm -hmm. yeah thanks for that uh the next uh part is sort of like the convergence results like how good is your approximation so you have some on your function f and then your interpolant okay so you either have a piecewise linear interpolant which is called p sub n or an s sub n which is for your cubic spline um uh, it turns out that you can show and i think there's a proof of this in the book for the piecewise linear case but not for the cubic spline for the piecewise linear case it turns out that if you have some smooth, if your function is smooth enough, uh, meaning that you have twice differentiability and then you have equally spaced nodes, and that's enough to show that the uh, maximum deviation of uh, your function from your from your approximation over the inter interval you're doing your interpolation for is upper bounded by a couple of things. The size or these the distance between two, two nodes and the second derivative, uh, the norm, the sup norm of the second derivative of that function. So that's uh, kind of cool. Um, but this is not very useful because you typically in applications, you don't know what F is. Okay? So you're hoping that F is smooth enough so that this bound will sort of like uh, kick in. Um, for cubic splines that are of the not a not variety, you need actually four times differentiability. And then some of those not a not, and then include those not a not restrictions, okay? And it turns out that you could show that it's upper bounded by h to the four, okay? Some function of h, uh, some, it's proportional to h to the four, fourth power. So in that sense, you have, much better accuracy for cubic splines because h will tend to be small okay h will have to be <clears throat> will tend to be small so here h to the four will even be uh smaller than h square so there in that sense you would prefer typically you would prefer cubic splines but at the cost of uh this differentiability thing okay yeah and there are a couple of exercises um uh, in the in the book that I'll just show, uh, it's about the performance of the polynomial interpolant, okay, which is I think the Vandermond thing, uh, the plinterp and the spline, and here you see the function is actually specified, but in practice you actually don't know this function, okay. So this is really typical kind of stuff, and uh, again you repeat sort of like this broadcast kind of stuff here, um, and. Uh, I put this line here in, in, I commented out this line because there's actually two versions of the spline, cubic spline interpolation implementations. One is the spline 1D that is built in, presumably this is better. And then the one is S, S spin terp, which is the one that you see in the book, which literally sets up the linear system from scratch. So... I'm not sure if spline 1D does that too. So, but if you try your calculations, I think spline 1D is faster than spin terp. Okay. There. And here's sort of like the, the picture for it. And I use the shorthand for leg. Um, and I sort of like plot the the three the three interpolants. Okay. There's a slight difference in the way you do the plotting. Here, it's not P3, but rather the function from X, so or the mapping from X to P3 of X, okay? Because uh, the return value for this one is different from the rest, okay? Um, one thing that I want to point out is sort of like, uh, for the cubic spline, uh, let me see. So it's this violet, or lavender kind of curve. Uh, 
yeah, you would see that here it's it's flat here in this part. Thing. But for the Vandermond kind of thing, it's sort of like it really fits uh, a, a very high degree polynomial uh, in between all of these points. And then you have an exercise that is weird, which is this flying saucer exercise. Uh, there's a parametric plot for for it. So let me just go to that exercise. Yeah. So here you have a uh, flying saucer shape. Uh, you have X and this X and Y are functions of S is equal to 0 to 15. Okay. So, so that's sort of like the... Um, uh the exercise it's not really a very fascinating exercise the the what i couldn't figure out is that is the question to exercise b they say that there's a noticeable corner at the left side which corresponds to s equals zero from above and s equals 15 from below there's periodic variation on the cubic spline interpolation. So I'm not sure what that is because when I look at the flying saucer here, I don't know what they're looking for. So that, this is something that I don't know, but it is a it looks like a flying saucer. That's the only good news that I have for that one okay. there. Um, so I don't know what they are aiming for in that exercise, except for this. Um, yeah. And it took some time to figure out how to actually do, uh, how to actually put down this plot, because this is not a plot of the spline itself, but the range of the spline, because you're plotting it as a it's it's a parametric plot rather than the the plot of the spline itself, so you couldn't just use something like this to plot the spline because you need because there's a another function a, a, an argument which is coming from s equals zero to fifteen and why aren't the, they why aren't they curving at the points through the points but they look like straight lines uh, I would have expected this to be like a, a smooth out flying saucer since you're using a spline fit, right? Uh yeah, it's a it's a smooth yeah that's that's also something that I don't, don't it looks know like the first that. derivatives are zero at the points there. Yeah. Or, or not zero not so, zero. So when you when you plot the when you plot A here, it's actually smooth. But because the perspective is that the vertical and the sorry so no the, but I wonder if you're we're supposed to do with the spline uh in 2D space. You know what I'm saying? Uh, not versus some not versus parametrically versus some s, but rather a ver x versus y. Uh, you can't do that. I mean, you know, uh, actually I actually don't know how to do it exactly right off the top of my head, but I know you can do that. That's how like you know Illustrator works, right? Adobe Illustrator. So, <laughs> yeah. I so, think that's what they're getting at here, right? So you're supposed to end up with a nice little smooth uh, flying saucer, right? Yeah, yeah, I I guess so. So th this could I didn't be do this one. But. Okay. This could be homework too to think. So might might be my I I didn't do this right. No, but uh, when I saw the saucer, okay, I'm okay with this. The 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 thing is that what I know for sure is that A and B are smooth, but when you do this kind of plot in a bit differently, so you have x and y here, x and x axis and the y axis, uh, it's not gonna be. I don't think it's it it will be smooth. But yeah, I might uh, be wrong. I, I think it's because um, you're plotting a scatter, like a path on top. Yeah. So A and S are coordinates and they're just being connected. So, yeah. But that's not the actual functions. I think that's what uh -huh. you're saying. Yeah, that might, that might be the case. Yeah. Because you're saying plot X, Y, and then I think it's just making it yeah. a path. Mm. Okay. Then uh, then this has to be figured out. So I, I couldn't answer this question for now. Yeah. I think you could. Is there a way to change the reference of the function? So like you can plot. 
you have the plot function and then the range will go over the x-axis, but can you do that for the y-axis too? Oh, I'm not sure. Unless I invoke, uh, un unless you use sort of like the special parametric plot, there, there, there must be a parametric plotting tool available. But Yeah, I guess there's no S in this plot, so it's not exactly. Yeah, I don't know, it's interesting. Even if you did a parametric plot, it wouldn't change anything, right? It would just... You wouldn't see the fact that the S's were going smoothly to the points because you're not showing yeah. the S. But I think what they really did want you to do is do a, a spline of Y and X in two dimensions and no S is involved at all, right? It's just, just you know, figure out how I can make the points smoothly connecting with uh, continuous first derivatives, right? With Y with respect to X, or I guess X respect to Y at the edges there. Mm. Probably. The, hmm. yeah. Okay. I've so, done it a long time ago, so I just don't remember. Um, there's some trickiness, right? Because there's two points in the edges of the flying saucer where you you kind of care about the different derivative, right? Yeah. So yeah. So here, if you, if you talk about the derivative here, it's sort of like the derivative of y with respect to x instead, right? Right. Other than the derivative of uh, x and y with respect to s. So the, those derivatives are smooth. But the derivative of y with respect to x itself, that's not right. So you could match those instead and you would come up with a nice little smooth. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Again, it's something... probably easier than it sounds. I, just, I can't think right now. Yeah. Sorry about splitting no, no, it's... <laughs> Thanks for that. No, so something to think about as well. Um, yeah, so that's essentially the sort of like the interpolation part. There, the exercises for 5.2 and 5.3 are there's most of them are repeats of the demos so i didn't really go through them anymore and most of them are actually technical derivations um similarly for 5.3 yeah so most of them are really just showing that uh you have this um the, these convergence results uh but it's very very typical kind of typical kind of stuff um, there are some interesting exercises that say in 5.3 about uh, piecewise quadratic spline, which is also, you, you could set this up and it's a nice uh, exercise to do. Um, item seven is a bit more, a bit stranger in the sense that they really don't talk about periodic functions, but they ask you to do this sort of like, um, what if you want to impose a periodic function you you want s of x to be periodic so here you i'm not sure if the period itself is also unknown or you have to specify the period you have to give the period and then that instead of it being an unknown uh quantity uh so this part is not very clear to me and the direction is sort of like write out two new algebraic equations for these constraints in terms of the piecewise coefficients so there are restrictions on the function itself if you want a periodic function, and they also imply certain restrictions on, on the S prime and S double prime, but there would be three sets, I think, but yeah. So I'm not very sure about that part. So I didn't go through, I didn't move to B as a result. So those are sort of like the more challenging or these things that you need time to work on. Yeah. Okay, so I think I'll have a few more moments to talk about numerical differentiation, and I think I'll stop there. Uh, okay. The key theory, I'm gonna now going to move on to the key theory for numerical differentiation. The point of the those two sections, 5.4 and 5.5, is that you want to calculate the derivative without actually either deriving the derivative or obtaining a closed form for the derivative and then encoding the symbolic form of the derivative into your code, okay? So that's the sort of like the goal for this uh, for this section, okay? And the idea is that uh, instead of doing, uh, instead of encoding the symbolic form of the derivative, if it's available, what you're gonna do is to use evaluations of F around the neighborhood of a pre-specified point X sub zero to approximate the derivative at that particular point, okay? 
And the motivation is really coming from the diff from the definition of the derivative, which is the limit of this difference quotient as h goes to zero. Okay. So in a sense, if h is small enough, this is roughly the derivative. Okay. Uh, and here you could already smell uh, a subtractive cancellation showing up as well. So this these two are going to be very close to each other. Okay, and then you'll have this subtractive cancellation thing showing up. And that also has implications for the performance of uh, numerical differentiation algorithms. So the, the sort of like the idea in those two sections is to do interpolation first, then take derivatives, okay? So here's the a sketch for the linear case, okay? And as to why this will be a good idea. Okay. So here you have a point x sub zero and then the function value at x sub zero. Okay. So the the working, at least the given here is that you need to know your f. F has to be provided for you, okay, for this to work. So you have x sub zero and then you have the function value at x sub zero and then you have uh, another point that is near x sub zero called x sub zero plus h. And you could also evaluate the function at that point, okay? And if you want to get the an approximation of the derivative at x sub zero, one thing you could do is draw a line that connects these two points. And if you do the calculation, the equation of the line kind of looks like this, okay? So this is, again, some algebra. Uh, and then what you do later is you take the derivative of, of this line, okay? and then evaluate at x sub zero. And it's not gonna be surprising that the derivative is gonna be this thing, which is the finite difference quotient that you saw earlier, okay? And in the book, this is called the forward uh, difference, a forward difference formula, okay? There's, there, there are other ways to form this derivative, okay? You could have chosen a point that is to the left of x sub zero, and then you could go through the same process and then interpolate, take derivatives, and then you'll have another formula, okay? So if you want to obtain the finite difference formulas for the kth order derivative, the mantra is interpolate, so fit a polynomial, okay? And then differentiate k times, okay? And as an example, I give this center difference formula, which is an alternative to to this forward difference that you see here, okay? And the idea is that you have uh, three points this time. So without loss of generality, we'll put x sub zero equal to zero, okay? And you'll have two points around zero f of zero, okay? One point is h f of h, and the other one is minus h f of minus h, okay? So in contrast to the previous uh, slide, here you only look at a point to the, to the right of x sub zero. You could also look at the point to the left of x sub zero, or you could take two points, both in the left and the right of zero uh, of x sub zero. And if you want to do those two points to the left and right of x sub zero, you could obtain what is called the center difference formula. Okay. So mantra interpolate. Okay. So because you have those three points, you could fit a quadratic. Okay. Fit that quadratic, and you could you could write down this could be done by hand. Okay, and you'll get something that looks like this. Okay, afterwards you take the derivative, take the derivative and evaluate at the point in which you want the derivative, the value of the derivative for. Okay, so when you do that, you'll get the center difference formula uh, for f prime zero. Okay, and if you if if zero were x sub zero, this would be something like x sub zero plus h, and this is x sub zero minus h. Okay. And if you want the second derivative, you just have to take the derivative one more time. Okay. And you'll get this center difference formula for the for the second derivative. Okay. That's it. That's how, sort of like the process to get uh, these uh, difference uh, formulas. And in section five point four you will see a lot of these uh, tables here. Okay? And those tables here have these numbers, these fractions uh, present. And those fractions are actually related to the fractions that 
um, when you when you write when you write these formulas in a particular way, you'll be able to see those uh, fractions. So let me just give give that example here. Sorry. Uh, so here you see. This is for the table for the center difference formulas. And you see minus one half, zero, and one half here. If, uh, oh, sorry. That. Uh, uh. Yeah, see, you have f of h, f of minus h, the weight in front of f of h is one half, and the weight in front of f of minus h is minus one half. And that's what you see here. Minus h is minus one half, for h it's one half, and then for f of zero, it doesn't have weights, and it's zero here. So that's where those numbers are coming from, okay? This table that you see here is for the first uh, for the first uh, derivative, okay? If you want the second derivative, you'll have a different set of tables for it, okay? You'll have a different set of tables for them, okay? So, so the biggest issue here is really that there's just so many of them, okay? There's just so many finite difference formulas, and it's going to be extremely tiresome to actually go through uh, all the calculations for the weights, depending on how many points you want to 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 include in your approximation around the point at which you want to evaluate the derivative for. Okay, so there's just so so many of them. So the solution is to choose according to your needs. One is to one particular high need is to have good accuracy. And it turns out that the center differences have a higher order of accuracy compared to those backward differences, in the sense that, uh, in the sense that you have accuracy O H two M H here is a very small number, okay, and M here is sort of like uh, and M you could think of this as the order, and then for center differences is twice, so that means that it's fast you get faster convergence and you have better accuracy for center differences compared to forward or backward differences. And the intuition is sort of like you, you sample more points around the neighborhood of X sub zero. Uh, that's sort of like the, the intuition for it. Okay. Um, but there is one exception. There is a preference for centered formulas, but if you are looking at the endpoints the endpoints of your node set, no, T sub zero and T sub N, in that situation, the derivatives have to be either forward or backward only, okay? Because you don't have information beyond those nodes, okay? So that's the, unless you impose extra assumptions about uh, the smoothness outside uh, at, those, at those points, no? So that's something to pay attention to. And if you're really interested in finding how you got OH2M or OHM here, the calculation is really doing some sort of, you, you compare the derivative, the, the value of the derivative, okay? So F prime at X sub zero, compare it with your finite difference approximation. Take the difference between those two and then expand do some Taylor series approximations and then find the leading term. So um, let me just sh show you what it kind of looks like. One of those examples in 5.5.2 is exactly that. Take the difference between the real thing and the approximation and then replace, replace this f of h, okay? Replace this f of h or anything that is not related to f of zero okay, with a Taylor series expansion about zero. And the question is how far you're going to take that Taylor series approximation. And the idea is that you will include as many terms as you need so that you have a point at which the leading term will be non-zero. If it were zero, then you have to add more terms. 
okay? And you could see it here, actually. So if had you chosen not to put this second derivative here for the for the Taylor series approximation, this all thing will just cancel out, okay? Okay, so you'll you'll cancel out um, you'll cancel out this f prime zero, and then this f of zero will be removed from and the f minus f of zero will just cancel out as well, leaving u with zero. So that's not very useful. So what you do is you add more terms in the Taylor series expansion. It turns out you just need to add one more, and then you get the you get the desired uh, result that for a forward difference formula you have O H. Okay, for a forward difference formula with for the first derivative, the um, the uh, the accuracy is o, o of h. Okay. Yeah. So that's sort of like the idea. And you could do that for the exercise in 5.5.3. It's a nice example for you to, to also see that you need the third derivative in that situation. So you add the third derivative in the expansion, and then you'll get the desired result. Okay. So this definitely has the feel of those asymptotic expansions that you see in statistics. Okay. Uh, and these weights that you see there is really reminiscent of those um, edgeworth style expansions that uh, that you see in statistics. Okay. And um, there is a limit though as to so of course, if you have smaller h, the better. That's what you see from the convergence results, okay? But these convergence results that you see there are the ideal results. When you push, when you do this numerically, there are there's another problem. Uh, and that problem is how far you should push h to be small, okay? And there's a demonstration in exercise 5.5.1. I'll show this to you later on. And there's a demo as well showing you that you couldn't push h to be too small. That means that there's a sweet spot for for the choice of H. And this should this smells like a bias variance trade-off kind of kind of thing. Uh, and it's also it also smells like the choice of a bandwidth in non-parametric regression kind of situations. Okay. And sort of like the idea is that the derivative at a particular point could be thought of as a sum of the truncation error. And, and the first order accurate finite difference formula delta H, okay? The, the problem is that the this delta H is the ideal delta H, okay? You, what you calculate by hand. And there's a numerical version of it called delta tilde, uh, tilde of H. And the difference between these two is sort of like the round off. This is the numerical problem, okay? The, coming from the machine, okay? And I think the book has a typo in their derivation, but uh, I don't know. I tried it and I, I, don't, I don't think I'll get it. But if, so for them, this is plus, but for me, it's minus. So if you, if you do the calculation, you'll find that the difference between the real thing and what you calculate from the machine is a truncation error and a numerical error, okay? And then, and then they proceed with the calculation as to, how to balance sort of like these two things, okay? The truncation error and the sort of like an approximation of the round off error, okay? So if this delta H were first order accurate, then this truncation error is O of H. And if you want to balance these two, if you want to balance these two, you have an O of H here and you have an O of H minus one here. And to balance these two, you need to equate their orders of magnitude. And when you when you do that, you'll find that H has to be of order epsilon one half. And this epsilon is the machine epsilon. So that means that you lose half of the accuracy, half of the digits, sorry, half of the digits, okay? When you, when you implement a numerical differentiation algorithm, okay? For a first order accurate, uh, finite difference formula. If you have an, an order M method, okay, you'll get something that looks like this. And then the total error would be something that looks like this. Okay. So what this tells you is that it's a good idea to have to use a higher order different finite difference uh, formula. 
okay? Because the total optimum error would reach machine precision because if m m is large enough, if m is large enough, then this is really one, okay? And then, and if you want a finite difference formula that uh, uh, sorry, if you want, sorry, uh, let me think. Yeah, I think that's that's sort of like the message that you that you see here. And again, this again smells like one of those uh, exponents in non-parametric regression, like the two fifths kind of thing. Okay, there. Yeah. So. So the exercise that you see here is sort of like from the book. Uh, it's strange because they talk about second order accuracy in five point four, but it's actually in five point five. So. So there's a resequencing, a sequencing issue, but this is sort of like similar to what you see in the in the demonstrations. And here you can see that the center difference formulas are much closer to the derivative compared to the forward and the backward ones. Okay, that's the point of that exercise. Um, my only sort of like wish here is that I I wish I had time to do the version where I don't have too many push lines. Like I do it as a part of a in one go, there has to be a better way to do this so that you you could spare a few, uh, so that these lines will be fewer. Of course, the one way to do it is just to put this line in line 10, but that's a cheat no? there. I think I might not have a lot of time anymore. So there are other exercises here. Um, yeah, so this is one in exercise 5.5.1 this sort of like the roundup error. So the, the error goes down and after a while, it sort of like goes up because of this um, roundup error tends to dominate at that part, okay? Yeah, and then that will be the numerical integration next, okay? Yeah, I think I don't have time anymore. So yeah, I'll awesome. continue next time, yeah. Awesome. You always do a great job. Not